All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sherilyn Seely, and welcome to week two of the 2020 GIA Virtual Convening Power, Practice, Resilience Remix. We're incredibly excited to be here together for another week of sessions, speakers, and opportunities for deep thinking and learning. And although this format of the convening isn't what we expected, and I'd much rather be excited, excitedly greeting you in person at the ballroom doors, I am glad to be excitingly greeting you here on Zoom. And it is lovely to see so many of you. In fact, we have over 600 grant makers, national partners, and artists joining from across the country, from Washington, DC, from sovereign tribal nations, and internationally in Mexico, Canada, and more. And I know many of you are actually here for the first time, so welcome to your first GIA convening. If you haven't already done so, please review the GIA Virtual Convening Community Accountability Agreement, <coughs> excuse me, for details on how to show up and remain accountable in our community. And I just dropped that into the chat. We join you from GIA's home, headquartered on the unceded land of the Lenape and Wappinger peoples. We also hope, <coughs> we also, we ask you to join in acknowledging the Lenape and Wappinger communities and the original peoples of the land where you are located, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. I offer this acknowledgement as a commitment to participating in the dismantling of ongoing legacies of set settler colonialism. We invite each of you to share where you are joining from and share hellos in the chat if you have not already done so. I'd like to extend a special thank you to our colleagues who supported this, our first online convening. CERNA Foundation, the New York Community Trust, and Rockefeller Brothers Fund. Thank you. And also special thank you to our Looking Glass creative team, our volunteers, and the entire Grantmakers in the Arts team. Throughout today's keynote, feel free to use the chat feature to interact with other attendees and the Q&A feature to ask direct questions to our wonderful keynote speaker who I will introduce in just one moment. As a reminder, this keynote as well as all the other sessions will be captioned. To see the caption, go down to the control bar and click on the closed captions. You can make these larger in your settings box via the accessibility, accessibility tab on the left. The closed caption size is at the very top of the accessibility page. So before we start, we'd, I'd like to start off with one of our incredible keynote speakers. I'd like to introduce a video created and produced by Life Escobar, a storyteller and filmmaker. By filming the stories of activists, organizers, healers, and movements for justice in over 25 countries, Life has seen firsthand the role that storytelling plays in challenging oppressive systems and building movements for liberation. They believe that if we shift our cultural stories which sustain oppressive systems, narratives of domination, extraction, inadequacy, separation, and inevitability to narratives of wholeness, interdependence, connection, and power, we can create communities of belonging rooted in care for each other and all of life. You can see their bio via the link that I'm about to post into the chat. And we are glad to feature their work today. There's a story waiting to be heard. I am soft body and hungry longing. I am unfolding, backwinding, aches and emotion. I am touching the threshold of my surrender. I long for the place where I don't need to compartmentalize my sorrow, where I can be seen trembling and scared, unknowing. 
I twist into the tightness in my back, moving breath into womb, meeting places that refuse to be touched. I moan the underbelly of my sequestered frustration, move foot by foot on moist ground on riverside rocks. Does this landscape see me? I'm giving myself to the music, finding myself in the song, permission to touch all that is hurting and longing, to let it be prayer, to let these aches have form, voice. They say, fold your body into shapes that will allow your sadness to be known. Trust in the evolution of your tides. Fall on your knees and say yes to this rocking in your hips. Here is your heart. Break. Fold here until the dark envelops you like a hug from the abyss. The arms of grace waiting for your surrender. Here you are known, ancient bones dusted in fresh soot, muddy depths hold promise of breath to come. Held by the dark, you face the unfaceable, accept the unknowable, step forward towards liberation. You are here. Be seen in your sensuous conversation with the earth. Honor your opening as the whole world reaches toward you. Let yourself be seen by life, breathed by life, touched by life, held in the web of life. A song comes from the depths. Let yourself be loved. There is a story waiting to be heard. It's a story of belonging, of body as earth, of earth as home. Wow, that was awesome. Thank you so much, Life, for that incredible video and a great way to get us grounded and, and feel full of life after watching, watching your video. So thank you for that. And, and now I am honored to introduce our keynote for the day, Maysoon Zayed. Maysoon Zayed is an actress, comedian, writer, and disability advocate. She is a graduate of and a guest comedian in residence at Arizona State University. Zayed is the co-founder and co-executive producer of the New York Arab American Comedy Festival and the Muslim Funny Fest. Among so many other accolades, Maysoon was a full-time on-air contributor to Countdown with Keith Olbermann, a, col a columnist for the Daily Beast. You can see her full bio at the link that I will post in, a, in the chat in just a moment. And I'm honored to welcome her to today's keynote. Maysoon, take it away. Hi, everybody. 
My name is Maysoon Dayed, and for those of you who can't see me, I look like the lost Kardashian. I have cinnamon skin, long black hair. I'm wearing this like out of this world feather Oscar de la Renta jacket that no artist can afford because my stylist, Angie Hassan, uh, lent it to me. I'm sitting in front of a bookshelf of books I will never read, but were sent to me for free from the authors. So this is me promoting them, but I can't vouch if they're good or bad. I really um, have no idea. And I'm wearing lipstick that's red and a little bit too bright and struggling with my ear pods. Um, so thank you so much, Grant Makers, for having me here today. I want to tell you all a little bit about myself. In the Oppression Olympics, I would win a gold medal. I'm Palestinian, I'm Muslim, I'm a woman of color, I'm disabled, I'm divorced, and I live in New Jersey. If you don't feel better about yourself, maybe you should. But the reality is, you know what? There is no oppression in our Olympics. Our oppressions don't compete. And if there was, I wouldn't win. Yeah, having a disability is oppressive. We face unspeakable amounts of violence. We have outrageous unemployment rates. We are often paid sub-minimum wage. But the reality is, as a verbal disabled person, I have more privilege than a non-verbal disabled person. As someone who limps, I have walking privilege. The reality is that when I walk into a room, I immediately have more privilege than a Black disabled man. But if there was an oppression Olympics, I still insist that I would win. Now, <clears throat> I'm what they call a super crip, like a super accomplished disabled person. And like superheroes, I have an origin story. And I want to share it with you. My mom looks like Julia Roberts. And my dad looks like Saddam Hussein. And the way they met is such a cool story. They're first cousins. My dad swears that the first time he saw my mom, he knew she was the one. And I was like, Daddy, how'd you know she was the one? And he said, your grandfather, he told me. And then my mom had a nickname for my dad. She called him her husband. And when I was born, my parents did not think that God would be so generous as to bless them with another girl child. So they had only prepared a name for a boy. Super original. If you're knocked up and you want to steal it, go for it. They were going to name me Muhammad. Now, when they saw I was a girl, they decided instead to name me Muhammadia, the female version of the name Muhammad. Now, Muhammad is a great name. It's the name of a prophet. It's the name of the greatest boxer that ever lived. But being named Muhammadia is like being named Smurfette. Thankfully, the doctors told my parents I was going to drop dead, and they didn't want to waste such a great name on an angel baby, so instead they named me Maysoon. Now, fun fact, all Arabic names have a meaning, and when your parents don't know the meaning of your name, they lie to you. So if you're a boy, they tell you it means lion. It means lion, Habibi, roar, and they're lying. And if you're a girl, they tell you it means a beautiful flower, but only seen in the heaven, and that's why you never see it. So I grew up thinking Maysoon meant heavenly flower. And then I met an Iraqi linguist when I was 27 who informed me that Maysoon actually means lemur. My parents named me Zabumafu. They named their brown, shaking, fuzzy baby monkey, and I survived. Shaking. Hmm. Let's talk about that. So I'm not drunk. I'm probably the only person in America who's not right now, but the doctor del who delivered me was. And as a result, I have something called cerebral palsy. My brain is damaged. Messages from my brain to my body go in all the wrong directions. And the result is that I shake it, shake it, shake it like Taylor Swift. But she just wants to shake, 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 and has her entire catalog controlled by a man, while mine is completely involuntary. But I don't want you to feel bad for me, because there are perks to being palsy. And one of the perks to being palsy is we do not have to stand online. 
And in the chat, throw it up for me. In the before time, that's what I call the time before the pandemic. I've been sitting in my basement since March 13th. Everything before that is the before time. In the before time, what was the greatest place on earth not to stand online? Disney. I used to love to go to Disney as a kid. I'd go on Space Mountain like 15 times. Then I would go out to the line and I'd find a kid that was just like beet red, like blazing in the sun under the sign that says two hour wait from here. And I'd be like, hang in there, Timmy. It's totally worth it. I just went on Space Mountain 15 times. Lifelong disability loves me. But my favorite ride at Disney was the teacups. If you've never been there, you sit in a giant teacup and they spin you around like really fast. Every time I rode Alice in Wonderland's teacups, it's actually called the Mad Hatter ride. Every time I rode that, I would walk straight for like six minutes after. I was like, this place really is magical. But it all went bad. Because a bunch of the parents started renting disabled people so that they could cut the lines and they got caught. And now nobody's allowed to cut the lines and it's no longer the happiest place on earth. And I just wish I could have been one of those tour guides because I would have made it a teachable moment. I would have taken the kids away from their parents just for a minute and I'd be like, hey, Timmy and Sally. I wouldn't care what their names actually were. I would just call them Timmy and Sally. And I'd be like, hey, Timmy and Sally. Mommy and daddy did a very, very bad thing. And you're just one little accident away from being just like me. So hold on tight, kiddos. Now who wants to go on Space Mountain? Disability does not discriminate. We are the one group that you can join at any time, whether you want to or not. It does not discriminate based on race, religion, economic class, gender, orientation, age, everyone is welcome at all times. Maybe we should all be a lot more like disability. Now, in addition to telling my parents I was gonna die, the doctors who delivered me told my parents that I would never walk. Now, let me be clear. There is absolutely no shame in not walking or using any mobility device you feel frees you. I often see journalists use the term wheelchair bound. Wheelchairs do not bind, they free. And we need to destigmatize mobility devices. It's not giving up using a cane, it's common sense to lessen your pain. But when I was born, I was born before the Americans with Disabilities Act was signed. I know that's hard to believe because cinnamon don't crack, but it's true. I am older than the ADA. And so my dad, he was determined to teach me how to walk. And he had a mantra. And his mantra was, you can do it. Yes, you can, can. And he had two methods of teaching me. The first was to place my feet on his feet and just walk. I walked miles on that man's shoes. His second technique was to dangle a dollar bill in front of me and have me chase it. My inner stripper was so strong. I was running in stilettos by kindergarten. So, kindergarten. I had three older sisters. They were all enrolled in public school number six. And when I turned five, my father took me to enroll me and the superintendent informed him that I would have to go to a school for children with Down syndrome. Now, my immigrant father, knowing nothing about the law, leapt to his feet and said, Mr. Kalagraki, if you send my daughter on the short bus, in the name of Allah, I will suit you. Now, I'm not sure if Mr. Kalagraki realized that my dad said he was going to sue him and not shoot him, but it doesn't matter because when an angry Arab man walks into your office with his disabled daughter on his toes, invoking the name of Allah, you better listen, and Mr. Calagreco did. I do not believe that I would be sitting here right now speaking to you, um, grant makers, if I had not been given the opportunity for a free, accessible, mainstream education. In the past three years, 72 protections for students with disabilities have been rolled back. 
we need access to education to move forward, become more accessible, not less. Make sure that every space you create is accessible. Don't wait until someone with a disability asks you to caption, to provide a ramp, or to provide a quiet space. Assume that disabled people will be there. We are the largest minority in the world, 20% of the population at least. Any space that you make inclusive not only makes it easier for disabled people, but also that very elite class. You know who I'm talking about. Moms with strollers. That's what it's really about. Don't even think about us. Think about them not complaining to you anymore. Okay, so. I grew up in Cliffside Park, New Jersey. By the way, I love to interact with you all, but I kind of have a problem scrolling. But if you pop some questions into the q and I'll spend the last five minutes of my keynote um, interacting with you because I'm like Tinkerbell and I die without applause. And as I mentioned, I have been sitting in my basement since March 13th waiting for the rest of the world to mask up, test up, and get vaccinated. And I want to take a moment to be super serious about the importance of grants. So on March 1st, I got a phone call from my agents. And in exactly two minutes and 43 seconds, because I remember hanging up the phone and seeing that number, my entire income disappeared. All of my upcoming live events were wiped off the calendar. And we had no idea when I would ever get back on the road. Now, I average 200 shows a year. I'm extremely blessed and privileged. And I'm a disabled person who gets absolutely no assistance because I am blessed and privileged. But being disabled is extremely, extremely expensive. And when, in a heartbeat, my income was wiped out, I had no idea where my next paycheck was going to come from. I had no idea how I could continue to create and meet the deadlines that I had for things like my comic book series. Because I'm palsy typing is not my thing. I have a typist and she would need to be paid. Without the ability to pay her, I couldn't deliver the manuscript for my upcoming comic book series. And I remember my body just shutting down at the fear of the fact that due to the pandemic, I wouldn't have access to things that alleviated my pain, such as massage or physical therapy, that I would have to do yoga remotely, that everything in my life was going to change. But also the fear of not being able to create, not only not being able to get on stage, but not get my ideas out of my head onto paper because it costs money. And what saved me was a grant. Zeba Rahman, who was not the person who gave me the grant, but is part of this wonderful organization, helped me immensely. Because the reality is, I couldn't even apply for a grant without someone to help me. And I want you to know that grants can save lives. It's not about spoiling people. One of the things that Zeba taught me that I never thought about was when I was applying for grants, I just wanted money for my typist. I just wanted to make sure I could pay her. And Zeba reminded me that I too had to live. That it's okay to say, I need to have this grant, not just to support whatever I'm creating, but to support myself so I can create. But I found the grant making, uh, the grant applying process to be impossible. Uh, a lot of people with neurological disorders lack executive function. And those applications can be so overwhelming. So without the help of a mentor like Zeva, I don't believe I would have achieved my goal of receiving a grant, which thank God I did and was able to support my work through the end of the year and genuinely give me strength of body and peace of mind. So the work that you're doing is important. I don't know the solution, but let's figure out how to make it more inclusive for people who maybe lack executive function or lack financial resources or the ability to plug into the platforms that are most often um, available. So that's my little pep talk for grant people. And now I wanna to talk to you about my best friend, Tina. So I grew up in Cliffside Park, New Jersey. 
And my hometown is super diverse. There's 33,000 Italian Catholics and six Arabs who are all my family. And since I was five years old, I've had the same best friend. Her name is Tina. And I gotta tell you, I was never bullied. I was never made fun of. Tina would take me a midnight mass on Christmas Eve and show me off. And she'd be like, she is from where Jesus is from. And I'd be like, I'm from Jersey, Bon Jovi rules. So anyway, the big difference between Tina and I was that every single summer she would go to the Jersey Shore and my parents would send me to live in a war because my parents thought that if we didn't go back to Palestine every year, we'd grow up to be Britney Spears, multi-millionaires being held against their will by patriarchy. Um, so every year when I would go, Tina would come up to me and she'd say, are you scared? Are you scared to go to Pakistan? And I'd be like, yeah, I'm terrified, which is why I'm going to Palestine. Anyway, uh, Tina always treated me as an equal. And when I turned 21, she made me her designated driver. Why? Because Muslims don't drink, or at least we don't admit to it on social media. Now, Tina making me her designated driver was a very, very, very bad idea. Because every time I got pulled over, law enforcement thought I was wasted. So they'd come to the window, I'd be like, hey. And they'd be like, are you drunk? And I'd be like, no, I am not drunk. I am disabled. And they would be like, okay, well, we're going to need you to get out of the car and walk a straight line. And I'd be like, all right, let's give it a shot. Because it'll be a gosh darn miracle if I can can. Let's do this. So what I did instead was I learned how to sing the alphabet backwards. So I was like, Z, Y, X, V, U, T, W. And they were so impressed. They would slow clap like the end of that movie, Rudy. And they'd be like, you go, girl. And what I didn't know was how lucky I was. I didn't know I was lucky. 50% of all Americans killed by law enforcement are disabled people. 50%. We must do better. Um, I forgot at the top of my, my set, which the professional people call a keynote, um, I forgot to acknowledge I'm sitting in a basement built on the land of the Ramapo Lenape. And I also, of course, am the descendant of an indigenous displaced people, the Palestinians. So let's honor all of us who have fought for our existence. Um, so like most Muslim girls growing up in America, I had a dream. And my dream was to be on the daytime soap opera General Hospital. And I pursued that dream by going to Arizona State University, Forks Up, Sun Devils. Um, I don't know how they indoctrinated me that way, but like literally, I cannot say the word ASU without saying Forks Up. It's really scary. It's like a very Pavlovian thing. And our mascot is a devil, so that probably tells you something. Anyway, <laughs> the reason I went to ASU is because I went to college during affirmative action and um, the admissions officer called me and she literally said this, I will never forget. She said, May soon, we had always looked for a black lesbian in a wheelchair, and then we found you. And so I was like, oh my God, you're gonna give me so much money, and they did. And I was like the pet lemur of the theater department. All my professors loved me, all the other students loved me. I got A's in all my classes, I got A's in all my classmates' classes, they were actors, they needed my help. And um, the one thing that was weird was that I never got cast in any of the shows, and I couldn't understand, like I'm getting A's in Shakespeare and Meisner, I'm not getting cast in any of the shows. Well, my senior year, I always forget there's a camera and I'm like, ah, um, I'm still on stage in my mind. Um, I, I, senior year, Arizona State University, forks up, decides to do a show called They Dance Real Slow in Jackson. It's about a girl with cerebral palsy. I'm a girl with cerebral palsy. So I'm like, free at last, free at last. I finally got a part. I'm free at last. I didn't get the part. Sherry Brown got the part. I don't even change her name. So I went running. I went limping quickly to the head of the theater department's office. And I was like, can you explain to me? how I didn't get a role 
that I was literally born to play, and I'm using the word literally correctly in this sentence, Jean. And she said, you can't do the stunts. And I said, if I can't do the stunts, neither can the fucking characters. Hollywood, Hollywood, college was imitating Hollywood. Hollywood has a sordid history of having non-disabled actors play visibly disabled on screen. People with disabilities are 20% of the population, but we're only 2% of the images you see in entertainment and media. And of that 2%, 95% are played by non-disabled actors. If you can't see it, you can't be it. If every single time a disabled kid see someone visibly disabled on their screen, miraculously healed as they strut down the red carpet to pick up their Oscar because you know disabilities win awards. What you're telling them is that they don't belong. Visible disability, much like race, cannot be played. So if a wheelchair user can't play Beyonce, then Beyonce can't play a wheelchair user and she can do anything, just not that. And the reason I use visible disability is because we have no idea how many people with invisible disabilities grace our screen. Invisible disabilities like lupus, chronic pain, fibromyalgia, depression, bipolar, um, neuro neurodivergence. There's so many different things that unless we are privy, we don't know. And the stigma against invisible disabilities is so strong that if even the most famous celebrity fears what will happen if they reveal their status. So, my Sue, so it's, yeah, I have a, I have a quick question, and in, in in the spirit of what you're just talking about, that someone sent into the chat, can I? Yeah, 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 yeah. for sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So, uh, from Scott Stoner, he says, "We so enjoyed your message at the APAP conference a few years ago." So, how do you feel? the growing visibility and support for the Black Lives Matter movement has affected our friends and colleagues with physical and other disabilities? That's the first question. There's another one after, but I'll, I'll wait till you just the first one and then we'll go to the next. I think that there's a neglect of the overlap of the disabled community and the Black community. I think that we have multiple issues on that front. So while Black Lives Matter has been extremely inclusive, to the disabled community. Let's be realistic. We live in a country where protesters for Black Lives Matter were getting shot with rubber bullets and tear gassed. So if you're a disabled person who wants to be part of that fight, I feel like it's so important to create avenues where disabled people feel like their activism doesn't have to be on the street, that they don't have to risk their lives. And I understand how important it is to put our bodies on the line but I think that the disabled community is part of this revolution and this resistance. When I talk about police violence against disabled people, please keep in mind that is disproportionately black men and women, followed by brown men and women. And of course, the entire mental health community is more at risk than those of us who are, are visibly disabled. Um, I think both movements need to embrace each other more. I think the disability movement, disability rights movement is extremely white. And I think it's been one of the hardest lifts of my advocacy is making white and, you know, light people like me kind of understand that we have privilege because when you're discriminated against so violently and so consistently as disabled people are, it's hard to convince them that they have privilege it's hard to convince the community that a white disabled man in a wheelchair can't speak for a black disabled woman with mental health issues, um, that we're not a monolith and that we need to be more inclusive. It's been a really, really heavy lift. There's some super racism built into the disability community because we have been taught that we lack services because black people are faking it and brown people are illegally stealing it. And so they've kind of pitted the communities against each other. And I think the disability rights movement needs to be much, much, much more inclusive of Black people and people of color. In the same vein, the Black Lives Matter movement has gotten better with the violent murder of Elijah McCain. 
of being inclusive and um, acknowledging the overlap of disability and police violence. Right. But these are communities that have less access to services and less acceptance often because of that lack of access to services. So there's a lot of work to be done, but these communities coexist, they must coexist and we have to fight on. Yeah, thank you, Maysoon. Um, I'll, I'll still read the second part of the question, but you, you definitely addressed it very well just now. And so Scott continued to ask, to ask, how has the broader interpretation of inclusivity affected opportunities, challenges, and issues for people with disabilities? And you talked a lot about how there needs to be more of yeah. an acknowledgement of that overlap. But if you want to say anything else, please feel free. I just, I haven't seen, in, excuse me, I haven't seen inclusivity in action. I've mm -hmm. seen a lot of talk and a little action. I think like I'm still asking every single Zoom uh, show I do, do you have ASL or captioners and they're always in shock. I try to make sure that everyone at every meeting that I'm on Zoom with does an audio description to acknowledge the blind. Um, but I think that A, people have made a giant leap forward with inclusivity because we moved into a virtual world. And yeah. being in the physical world was often exclusive and inaccessible to us. So I really hope that if we ever get free, we keep these moves that we um, made going <laughs> forward. Do we have another question? I can, as long as you warn me with three minutes left, I can tell a closing joke because we, you know, but questions are so much more important to me. <laughs> yeah, there, another question came in um, and I'll just- The answer time. is C, the answer <laughs> is C. Please fill in the bubble next to C, thank you. All right, okay. so, so Elena, you heard that the, the answer is C, right? So I'll also, you know, we have about six more minutes for the, um, for the keynote. Okay, the, so let's take this set. question. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, yep. I know. It's supposed to be a keynote, but I'm a comic. And I'm just like, oh, yeah. it. I'm like, I got to do my closing joke. It's really important for humanity. <laughs> yes. No, you, have to. you really do. So, so I'll get to this question quickly um, so that we can get to it. So Elena asks, in your opinion, what is the number one best way for non-disabled people or able people or people without disabilities? She's, she's not really sure how, how specifically to to address that community, mm -hmm. um, to advocate for and act on behalf of people with disabilities. So I go with non-disabled. And I think that the best way to advocate is to just fight for equality at all times. So, you know, understand that, that when people with disabilities, and by the way, see, I did disabled people and people with disabilities. Um, I prefer disabled people. I don't think I'm with my disability because I can't leave it behind. I can't be like, I'm going out with you, without you tonight, cerebral palsy, find something else to do. So I call myself a disabled person, but there, there's no faux pas except for the R word or the C word, which is cripple. We use it, you can't, it's our N word, whatever different histories, yeah, don't minimize. Um, so anyway, but to get back to the center, it's all about equality, right? So it's not about like learning about their disability and understanding what it's like to be in their body. It's like acknowledge pain when it's voiced and figure out what you can do to alleviate that pain and how you can always create that level playing field, that infamous level playing field that we talk about. What makes it equal for everyone? And start like really simple. If you're having a birthday party and you invite your friends, think about like who can't do stairs, who can't stand for a long time. Who is it okay if they bail the last minute? Because their mental health is an organ and they can't override it to come to your birthday any more than they could if they sprained their ankle. So like give space to people when they need it. So anyway, I have some advice that you guys don't want to hear. <laughs> and uh, this is it. This is really important for grant making. Never ask any human being if they are pregnant. Never. The only time that is a valid question is if you see a skull coming out from between their legs. Listen, I have one of those bellies that always looks like I'm five months pregnant, like always at all times. The black is hiding it, but trust me. So like I'd be going through TSA, I'd get flagged for extra screening because I'm always random. <laughs> anyway, um, and TSA agent was patting me down and she goes, is it a boy or a girl? And I go, Doritos, Cool Ranch. 
so I'm at the United Nations. This is in the before time. And this woman puts her hand on my belly and she goes, oh my God, when are you due? You look like you're about to pop. And I go, I am about to pop. I'm about to pop you in the face, you bitch, which is my last piece of advice. Please, I am begging you. We must stop using the word bitch. It is violent, it is misogynistic. And after surviving the past four years, we must do better. But grant makers, I know it is hard to stop using a word you love. So I am here to give you the replacement word for the B word. Now, anytime you wanna say that, you will instead say popple. It's spelled P-O-P-P-L-E. It's my fetch, it's my fleek, and I need you to help me make it happen. I'm gonna use it in some sentences to give you some confidence. Where are my popples at? Popple, please. Popple better have my grant money. Or my favorite one, bow down popple, bow down popple, which means stick your head in your butt and roll out of here. The world is broken, but we can fix it. We can fix it by saying no to arming violence worldwide and saying no to violence against women. We can fix it by saying no to being an internet troll and to raising an internet troll. We were taught that sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And that is simply not true. Never be the person who says or types the words that harm another human being. If you feel like spewing hate, Google cats on glass tables, you will thank me. And say no to being silenced. Your voice is your weapon against injustice. I beg you, use it. My name is Macy Nzayad, and if I can, can, you can, can. Thank you. Thank you so much, Macy. <laughs> I am like, oh my gosh. You are so brilliant, and Can someone I, take I, it? Sorry. Sorry, can someone take a screenshot of me? Because they lent me this jacket for free and <laughs> I have to put a picture up. Absolutely, I'll take one okay. on my computer, but I think someone else will probably take one too. Okay, what were you saying? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I did watch your, your TED talk that you gave a few years ago and I was completely blown away. Um, and now, now I'm like a new level of blown away <laughs> here on the, on the, on the Zoom for our comp, our convening. So thank you so much for that. That was excellent. And um, you know, you said grants can save lives. It's beyond beyond just the project, beyond you know your set. And and I really appreciated you bringing that and all that you did to this conversation. Um, we are privileged to share the voices and leadership of women of the Alana disability communities. And for those who don't know the meaning of Alana. I'm gonna post a link here in the chat with all sorts of information about it. So you can check that out. There you go. And it is such a gift to be able to laugh together, especially in this year 2020 when we are not free yet. We will be <laughs> free, I hope, in this year 2020 um, and discuss you know, issues at the intersection of pandemic, coronavirus, uh, structural racism and, and others, other issues. We look forward to the rest of our convening together where we can continue from here, centering racial equity and justice as we imagine new pathways to the future that we want together. And up next, we have three rounds of concurrent breakout sessions and we'll end the day with roundtable discussions. Today, our breakouts are at 12 p.m., 1.30 p.m. and 3 p.m. Eastern time. And all sessions can be accessed via the schedule page on our website and be sure to click the access zoom rooms button at the top of each page. And so I will share a link with you here for the schedule. If you haven't seen it yet. And we will also have our final convening workshop workshop this Friday, but you must be registered separately to attend. So be sure to register for that. And this Friday's workshop Friday, November 20th is at 1pm Eastern time called Reimagining Narratives of Power, Cultural Strategy, and Philanthropic Practice. Here's a link to check it out. And we are so glad to be with you a second week. Be sure to use your social media to tweet about us and post, on us, post about us on Instagram, and we'll see you at the sessions. Thank you, everyone. Hey, folks. Could I please get a copy of the chat from 11 to 12? Here I go, here I go again, girl, what's my weakness?
Can you hear me? No. Hi, Masoon. Yes, absolutely. Sorry. Thank you so much. It's good for my agents just to see um, the feedback because this is such a new format still for so many people. Yeah, absolutely. Not a problem. We'll we'll send that over to you. Um, and uh, you we can also have send some... it over to Elizabeth. Yes, uh, that's sorry. That's what I meant. Um, and we have uh, some screenshots we'll include as well for your fabulous uh, stylist. <laughs> Thank you so much. I had so much fun. I am so grateful that Cheryl Lynn was laughing because it's so hard not to have any feedback. I mean, even though you were muted, I could see her go, ha, ha, ha. And I was like, I yeah. <laughs> awesome. Nice I so I so wish that you called us all on our BS when but because I, I watched one of your sets and you said that you know you you all wish you were you were disabled at one point circling around parking lots and around Christmas time and I was like oh man she's gonna call us out and I was so <laughs> you know I I got too involved in everything I totally ran out of time but I'm glad that we got I'm like the performer that's like how many hours do I have three what are we doing where are we going <laughs> and then like I'm like Rand saved my life. I'm also wearing an Oscar de la Rente jacket that I need to promote on Instagram so they don't charge me for it. So the hustle is real from every single angle in the world. Thank you amazing. so much. If I can ever be of service, I'm always just a click away. Okay. Thank you so much, Maysoon. We really appreciate it. And there was so much love in the chat. I'm so glad you'll get to check it out later. Thanks. Yeah, it's really important for me to see what people um, are doing. So thank you all so much. Absolutely. Bye. Bye, Maysoon. Bye, Maysoon. Have a great rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate it.